This time on Graveyard Cars, Dougie does a deep dive when he completely builds out the rear end assembly for our 1969 GTX. Mark and George break out the hydraulics to reverse the damage done to Mark's newest acquisition. And a Graveyard favorite returns to help install the newly completed drivetrain in the 1969 GTX. The unburied, buried dead. The unburied dead are coming back, coming back to life. Are coming back to life. Self-proclaimed Mopar master Mark Warman and his protege painter Will Scott get paid to bring Mopar muscle cars back from the dead. They work with Mark's daughter Alyssa and his cousin Dougie. They're willing to travel anywhere to retrieve a customer's car, detailing how it lived its life and how it died. After that, they bring it back to make it look just like it did the day it was born. So on our 1971 Dodge Super B, this is the one we went up to Boring, Oregon and bought from the old guy that bought it brand new. Had a building fall in on it. So I'm not gonna be doing a complete restoration on this car, I'm not gonna restore it at all. What I wanna be able to do is put it on Graveyard Motors as a car for sale, so somebody can fall in love with it, buy it, and then I can either restore it or just sell it to them the way it is. So what we wanna do is be able to push that roof up out of there, push it up to a point, what you call rough it out, in the body shop business. But George hasn't done any collision stuff. He's done all of our welding and restoration work, but we really haven't worked together on collision. And this is a little bit of that collision world. Again, don't expect perfection out of this roof. It won't even be anywhere near it. But it will be interesting for you to see how when a car's in an accident, all you're doing is reversing what happened. Why are you looking like a gorilla? Because I'm looking forward to this. I mean, I'm excited. Well, gorillas are always happy, looking forward to stuff. You, yeah. You got that, can, can, that can foreboding. Be happy? A I mean, gorilla can be happy, but I mean, the way you're looking at it is like you're going to devour me or something. No, I'm happy. I'm ready to do okay. this. Okay. All right. I've been looking forward to this. Okay. George and I are going to work on pushing the roof out, roughing it out, and seeing if we can get the door to open and close and seal the glass and the quarter glass against the roof. All right. So what I think happened, according to the guy we got it from, a roof, it got a snow load on the roof, and the roof caved in. It looks to me like a pretty husky beam came down right here. And I'm gonna guess that it came down on this side first and then that side, because this side's so much further down than the other side is, right? Last week, Dougie disassembled and media blasted this rear end assembly for the 1969 Plymouth GTX, which is currently in the assembly stage. Now it's time for him to reverse the process and put all the pieces back together. I have the third member hanging right here on our overhead hoist. Makes it real convenient for me. I'm gonna go ahead and start working on putting this together. Put a bead of sealer around the housing here. This is to keep the gear oil in the housing. We don't wanna lose the gear oil out of this uh, rear end assembly. They're expensive to replace. So we're gonna run a little bead of sealer around the back of the gasket and then I'll put a bead around the top of the gasket <clears throat> then I'm going to set the third member in on top of that and let it start settling down great just like that pretty handy Got our restored gear set here, ready to go. And we have a couple tags. It's a sure grip tag to let somebody know that this needs sure grip oil. The clutches in the sure grip require a little bit of uh, an oil additive. We also have a tag letting us know that it's a 355 ratio. I'm gonna put this over here on the right side. I'm gonna put the tag about three o'clock position on the housing. Then we've got some new hardware to hold this thing together. I'm gonna tighten these down a little bit with an end wrench just to get a feel for 
how tight they are without squeezing the gasket out. Just kind of taking it down evenly. Let the sealer come out evenly. Now I'm gonna let that set and I'm gonna go ahead and put the axles and backing plates in. The quarter window's still good. It spit the roof out past it. If you actually look here, so you see here how this, if that roof had come straight down, it would have broke it. In this case, it shot the roof that way and then it went down, okay? So we gotta be able to get this roof up to that height right there, right? We know that this is the weather strip and that weather strip has to go right there. Okay, so I'm gonna roll it down out of the way. Now the other thing, I'll close this a little bit. It actually busted this window. When we bought the car, the window was broken out of it. So we had one of the guys put a window in it. Now we know that when this thing is all in place, this is how far I gotta get the glasses on here. Do you see this reveal right here? Yeah. You see how down here it's nice, right at the very base of it, the fulcrum point I think it is. And then it gets tighter and tighter and tighter. Now by the time we're up here, we're overriding it just like that quarter glass did. Again, I'm pretty surprised that it didn't bust that windshield. What we're gonna try to do is push that out a little while we do that one a lot. And we're gonna stage those back and forth together to try to get that up to where it needs to be, okay? Okay. Those are gonna be the two basic motions. But the middle of this is not gonna just come up automatically. I just like to start now and see what kind of motion, what kind of action's gonna happen when we begin to make the, the motions here. So we have two pumps right here. This pump here, is connected to the vertical pump that's going to, the ram, that's gonna push that roof up. This one that's in there diagonally right now, it's gonna push it out that way. I'd like for you to begin to pump that one up a little bit, I wanna watch it. Okay. Oh, see I've lost my tension here. Yep. It's actually moving all on its own there. Okay, go ahead some more. That's some metal snapping in there. Hear that metal starting to pop out? Yeah. It's just like old Christine, buddy. She's coming back to life. These backing plates cleaned up pretty nicely after uh, the Clemco cabinet and uh, the sandblasting that we did and just uh, coat of clear coat. They look really nice now. So here's our uh, metal gasket for the backing plate. Put my backing plate on right there. I think I might put just a little bit of grease around here for the bearing to slide in. We have a foam gasket, a dust gasket that goes underneath the axle. Here's our driver's side axle. Ready to go in. We also have a seal inside the housing. I'm gonna put some grease inside of that. So the way I set these axles in, to avoid damaging the seal, I carefully hold it in the center of the seal and then I gradually slide it in there. And then when I get right to the end of it, I tilt it up to get it into the third member. Lifting it off the seal. Might have to get a rubber mallet to tap this in with. Like that. And then we have the five nuts, identical to the ones that hold the third member in place. Get them started on the studs. Then you'll need an extension. And you'll have to uh, rotate the axle. I'm gonna have to uh, spin this around until it lines up. Okay. So we're starting to get some height out of here. It may be that we come up some more and continue to work that windshield post forward and then we'll go back and push the inside of it out. The metal stretch to pieces, so it's never going to just pop into place and look perfect. When metal bends like that, it stretches. When you put it back, it's still stretched metal. It's now, there's not enough room for it, all the metal to share the same space, so it starts wobbling like that. And that's what we're gonna end up with at the top. But what we're trying to do is just get it where these quarter window and door, where the quarter window and the door window seal against the car. 
Okay. Okay, so let's see how much we've gained, if anything at all, here. Look at that. Oh, wow. Remember that a little bit ago? Was all the way over. We, right here, we were all the way over to here, so that's already gone up about an inch and a half. In fact, right now, we're too far. I don't need to do any more with that pillar right there. This one back here is almost doing everything with just that little bit of pushing. We're still down back here. I don't think we need that diagonal uh, pour power in there anymore. I think I can back that off and we'll take this ram, move it to the middle and start pushing the middle of the roof up while we do the outer edge. And then we'll just keep an eye on this post right here. Okay. Okay. Now put the right axle in. We're greasing the housing so the bearing will slide in there. Put our gasket on. And our restored backing plate. So we're gonna slide that right on here. Our foam gasket for the axle. Hold it up off the seal, slide it in. I'm letting it rest in the housing until I get almost to the third member gears. Then I'm gonna tilt it up to get it into the splines. That one went easy. Okay, I don't know if you remember or not, but the right-hand axle has an adjusting collar inside to adjust the preload on the two axle bearings. So I like to back it off and then tighten down the nuts. Tighten it in as tight as I can and then I'll do the axle adjustment. What was that all about? There's a special lock tab that I'm gonna put on the last nut to hold that adjusting collar in place. So I'll put that on after I tighten this axle down. I got the axles in place and I've got the adjusting ring tightened down to where I want it. How I did that was to turn the adjusting ring all the way down until it was tight. And then I had to back it off. I used a hammer to tap on the axles, knock them together, make sure they're tight, and then look for just a slight movement in and out for a little bit of bearing free play. So here's the adjusting finger that holds the adjusting ring in place. So I usually just put it down here on number three position and put the special lock nut over the top of it. So run that down. Make sure it locks into one of the openings on the adjusting ring. Tighten that down. Okay, now we have the axles installed. Okay. Oh. See how that center is just sheet metal in there? Yeah, she's popping up. Okay, that's all right. Okay. So, I've got to keep a little tension on mine while you put some tension on yours. So I'm gonna have you go ahead and jack yours up, just one stroke at a time. Okay. Still to come, Dougie completes the highly detailed build-out of the rear end assembly. Mark and George pop and hammer the one owner Super B back to life. And Royal returns to help with the installation of the drivetrain for the 1969 GTX. But with Mark out of the picture, will Royal supervision get the job done right? Should I remember how to work this? This is a 1968 Plymouth Roadrunner. In its day, it was the smart, low-priced six-passenger coupe and one of the hottest performers on the circuit. Plymouth set out to develop a back-to-basics muscle car. They started off with a coupe, came with a sporty roof line, heavy-duty suspension, and shock absorbers. Everything essential to performance was upgraded. They powered it with a monstrous 383 four-barrel, featuring a special camshaft and dual exhaust. But if that wasn't fast enough, you could option the famous 426 Hemi. 
they added a touch of race car with air scoops on the hood, the iconic Roadrunner decal, red streak tires to grip the road, and heavy duty 11 inch brakes to stop on a dime, making this 1968 Roadrunner our corpse of the week. The next thing you wanna do is put the park brake cables in place. The right-hand park brake cable is about twice as long on this one here. The park brake cable has these springed fingers on here. These spring fingers will pop out and lock it into the backing plate. And once it's in there, it's really difficult to get that back out. To install that, all you do is just slip it through here and you push it in place until you hear it click. People like to use a little bit of uh, anti-seize lubricant on the backing plate where the moving parts of the brake shoes work. Okay, so after I have the park brake, brake cable in, I wanna put the wheel cylinder in. Here's the hydraulic wheel cylinder that actuates the brake shoes open and close every time you hit the brake pedal. Held in with two little screws on the back side, tiny little screws, quarter inch. You turn this wheel cylinder around, put the bleeder screw through the back, and there's two openings in the back to put the screw through. So just carefully put the little screws in place. Now we're ready to put the rear shoe on. One thing about the rear brake shoe, you can tell the difference between the rear and the front in that uh, the rear shoe has more pad material than the front shoe. The rear shoe does more stopping than the front, so they put more material on it. So that's one way you can always tell the rear shoe from the front. So I have the park brake actuator in place and the self-adjuster spring in place and the curved part for the cable that pulls the self-adjuster. You'll need your nail, two of the little hat washers, the two little washers that go on the top and the bottom of the spring, put one on top, one on bottom. They have a groove in them that goes over the nail. You just push it down, give it a quarter turn, and it stays in place. Put your nail through the little hole right here, and there's a little hole right behind the park brake actuator where that nail goes through. First thing you wanna do is hook the park brake actuator over the cable from the backside, slide it over, and then when it's all done, that spring will hold it in place. The push rod out of the wheel cylinder, it has a groove in it. Slide the brake shoe over that little push rod, put it up against the top pin, and then feed the little nail through. Then put one of your little hat washers on the spring, another hat washer, and then your tool. Give it a quarter turn, and that'll hold that in place. So then you have your spreader bar, which you have to slide in underneath the wheel cylinder, and it goes onto the park brake arm. So this blue spring on the front of the spreader bar is gonna lay right into this groove in the brake shoe. Put the brake shoe over the pin, over the actuator spreader bar, hold it in place. Put your nail through, got the nail in place, then your spring, your tool, quarter turn, got that in place. Now you have a self-adjuster that goes in the bottom. Some people call it a star wheel, and when you turn this star wheel, the self-adjuster will ratchet this thing up anytime your brakes get really worn down. So the star wheel or the brake adjuster on the bottom is actuated by this arm right here. So you slide this in so that the, the finger will ratchet this thing up to open it up. So put this in place over both shoes, and then you have a long spring that has a curved end on one end, and that's gonna go in this little hole right over the top of the park brake arm. Poke that in there, flip it over, pull it out like that. So this little spring will hold the bottom of the two shoes together and hold the adjuster in place. So the long spring on the bottom has a special curved end which goes back here on the rear shoe, and then the other hook end goes in the front shoe, right here. We have a little brake cable here, and a washer that goes right up here on the top, 
over the top of the pin, over the two brake shoes. Holds them in place. The adjuster cable goes on next, around this curved washer here. So here's a real nice handy tool that we used earlier to take the springs off. It also has an end to slide the springs back over this pin right here. So how this tool works is it has a curved end which hooks over this round knob. The brake spring for the front shoe is a short one. It goes in this hole right next to the wheel cylinder. Put the spring in there and then hook it with the tool. Put the tool over the pin and then pull it over and roll it in place. Put the cable back around the round washer there. And then the yellow spring, the longer spring, will go through that round washer and hold that washer in place. Pull the spring up. So now, the little cable that I showed you is the self-adjuster actuator cable. And it hooks over this little round hole right here. So pull this up, hook it in there, hangs on the back side of this green spring. And when the brakes expand, the movement of this will cause that arm to go up and down and adjust the brakes. So then you take the brake drum. This is where the brake linings will expand and cause the drum to stop the wheel. So when you put this on, feel that it's fairly snug against the brake shoes. Pop that down on there and we got one side done. Keep going. It's getting closer. Okay. Hang on right there. Let's roll that quarter window up and take a look. See how we're doing for height. See how much nicer that is before it was sticking way out here. Remember that? Yep. Now it's falling right in because this has walked right back out where it's supposed to. It's pretty cool. I just can't believe how much is coming out. Yep. I mean. Well, they take your time and you think it out ahead of time and you can win on these things. So that's now high over there. So I'm going to back this off and we're going to walk this out as we go across here back and forth. So get inside. Okay. Go ahead and crawl in. Will a four by four go in there or no? Um, yeah. You can put this on the top too, if it's easier. Since you're all set up down there. Yeah, yeah, like that. Like that? Yep. Go right ahead. Yep, there we go. There she goes. Yeah, like in that. If we had the headliner out, we could work that metal a little bit better. Yeah, we're not able to get to the, the reinforcements right there. In our corpse of the week, we learned that the 1968 Roadrunner was a low-priced six-passenger coupe and one of the hottest performers on the circuit. How many seconds would it take for the 1968 Roadrunner to complete the quarter mile? Was it 14.5 seconds, 18.2 seconds, 13.5 seconds? Think you know? Find out after the break. So, we learned that the 1968 Roadrunner was a low-priced six-passenger coupe and one of the hottest performers on the circuit. How many seconds would it take for the 1968 Roadrunner to complete the quarter mile? If you guessed 13.5 seconds, you were right. The 1968 Roadrunner was known to haul, and it was roomy enough to comfortably sit six passengers. One thing we have here is called a pinion snubber. Bolts to the top of the rear end housing 
and under real hard acceleration, the rear end is gonna to wanna to twist up. And this pinion snubber will actually hit the body of the car in an extreme torque situation. So the pinion snubber bolts right here on top with two little screws. Okay, we got that in place. Our left brake cable, park brake cable, is way shorter than the right because it's gonna loop around the car and they're both gonna hook together right here on the left side of this car. So the left brake cable is gonna go in through the front of this backing plate, pokes through this hole, so when you push this through, you'll hear them snap in place. So the park brake cable is installed on the driver's side. So I'll go ahead and put the wheel cylinder in place. through, put the park brake cable in place, put the nail through there, washer on, spring, there, this. goes on here. Still got to push that one out. So like I said, I figured it was going to be pretty ugly when we we're done, but at least it'd be functional so we could get it up for sale. Let me see where it was one more time. Uh, right. I want to push right here. Okay. That'll work. Like that. Yep, right. There we go. That was what we were hoping for. Yep, I just need to adjust those two windows and I'll be fine. So I'll get him to do the adjustment. I'll rock that glass forward at the front, rack this one back just a little bit, and then we'll have a good seal. Good job, buddy. Thank you. Good job. I can clean all that crap up. With a roof in place, Mark can get this rare one owner Super B detailed to hopefully sell to someone who's eager to become owner number two. Stay tuned. Dougie completes his ultra detailed rear end assembly restoration. And with Mark out of the shop, Royal returns to assist the ghouls with the installation of the newly restored drivetrain for the 1969 GTX. But if Royal can't remember how to lead the engine install, she never remember how to work this. Will the ghouls make it out without a scrape? Nope, nope, nope. nope. Okay, so what I've done here is to rotate the axle upside down and set my driver's side leaf spring on. That'll make it easier for me to uh, put the U-bolts through the shock plate. This is the shock plate, which will go on the bottom, and the U-bolts will reach through here. Shock plate goes on here, which is actually the bottom, and then 
The U-bolts will go around the axle through the shock mount plate. So we're gonna do two U-bolts on each side to hold the leaf springs on the axle. And what you wanna do is tighten them down evenly, all four nuts with a heavy impact gun. Okay, that's pretty good. We're gonna leave these a little bit loose because when we put this in the car, we need to be able to shift them a little bit side to side to line up with all the mounting points on the car. These are our front spring hangers that go into the body of the car. These are the rear spring hangers and the rubber bushings that go through the rear of the leaf spring. Slide one of those in each side and our uh, rear spring hanger will go in place like that. And then two of these will go through the body of the car. So we're pretty much built out on the driver's side. We're leaving all these things loose so that when we're ready to put this in the car, we can just pop these off, poke it through, and then we'll tighten everything down after it's in the car. Now I need to do the passenger side. Okay, so here's my passenger leaf spring. Set it in place there. Shock plate. Here's our front spring mounts. And our rear hanger. Put the new rubber bushings in place. So basically it's all ready to go in the car now. So we got a 69 GTX to put together. <laughs> okay, cut. Cut. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's fine. It's awful quiet in here. Hey, Royal. Hi, Justin. Haven't seen you in forever. <laughs> How's it going? Good to see you. Yeah, I haven't seen you like what since SEMA? Yeah, Mark called and said he needed some help. Oh, so. did he? Oh, cool. Here I am. Yep. Well, I'm just waiting for Doug to get the engine finished up and have him bring it over here and get it thrown in there. Oh, cool. So, so it's ready to go. Yeah, it's it's wow. real close. Oh, look. Oh, speak of the devil. Nice. Hi, Doug. Hey, Royal's here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We learned that the performance features were upgraded in the 1968 Plymouth Roadrunner, and their mascot was the famous Roadrunner from the Fast and the Furious Looney Tunes cartoons by Warner Brothers. True or false? Plymouth paid $80,000 to use the name and likeness of their Roadrunner, as well as its famous <laughs> horn. Find out after the break. So, true or false, in order to use the likeness and name of the Roadrunner, Plymouth had to pay Warner Brothers $80,000 for licensing. That is false. In fact, Plymouth actually paid $50,000, or over $360,000 in today's money. And they ended up paying an additional $10,000, or $72,000 today, to develop the now famous <laughs> porn. Hopefully it fits through there. Whoa, don't pull that out. Guess we gotta raise her up, huh? Get her up in there, let's get that rear end in. See if I remember how to work this. So far, so good. It's going up. Piece of cake. Second floor. Stop there. Okay. What do you say? 
nice and warm in here. Yeah, I think it's too warm. I'm I not. do too, I do too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we don't want to tighten those up though until we get the back in, in case we've got to move them. Okay, okay. Go. About three more inches. Good. How yeah. you looking? Okay. There we go. Did you get a couple Got of it on? in. There we go. Okay, got it. Seems to me I remember we're gonna have to move the back of those springs in our Yeah, we'll go a little around a little bit. Okay. Okay. Okay, you ready? Yep, ready. That's good. You hand me a shackle and some. I think yours. Oh, he's got them both over there. Here you go. Thank you. Okay. Nice. Oh, isn't this nice, Royal? Wish we had this when we were kids. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it made our lives a lot easier. <laughs> nope, we had to pay our dues, Doug. Yes, we did, because we had nothing. We Mark, had to pay the price. Mark had everything, and we had nothing. No, I don't remember Mark having everything. Well, he had 16 crowns after he broke them all in half. Well, this is 15 <laughs> more than I had. <laughs> I didn't have any because my brother ate them all. <laughs> Remember Vinny? I do. <laughs> Cousin Vince. <laughs> Cousin Vinny. Yeah. Did you get a wrench for those? Did you get yours in? Huh? Yeah. Oh, oh nice. That's all I Are we good or what? See, that was like record time, right? I think I need one of these at home. Isn't that nice? Yeah. Got to work. Hey, what are you guys doing tomorrow? Uh, working, <laughs> working every day, working man. Working every day. Yeah, every day. It's all we do. I need to pull the front axle out of my <laughs> power wagon. Yeah, we'll do that in our spare time. <laughs> we got a rear uh, shackles bolted in place. We got yep. the front spring perches bolted in place. Just do the shocks and about ready for the engine. We, yeah. We got a full rear suspension in in less than 15 minutes. Will said it'd take three hours. That's because he thought Mark was going to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Okay, we got this. All right. Look at that. Too bad. I'm telling you, that was less than 15 minutes. Ready? Ready. Ooh, golly, they don't get any lighter, do they? <laughs> nope, never. <laughs> okay. All right, we're going to have to go to your right. Right in there. All right, go ahead, drop her down. What? Go a little tight on your left side. Bring it to the right just a little bit. There you go. A little bit more. Awesome. Keep going? Yep. Hold it. Um, can you that pull power your... unit? Yeah, can you pull your to your right, pull the back to your right. Because if I remember right, it's been a while, but we had it a little bit, Royal. Yeah, and come forward just a little bit. Right there. And hold it. Oh. Up a little? Yep. yep. There. Okay. Um. Uh-huh. Ready? Yep. Yep. Nope. Oh, oh, nope. Can you twist yours to your right just a little bit more? A little bit more? Okay, right there. I mean, I'm pretty... I'm pretty cockeyed back here. Yep, that's okay. Okay. I think if I remember right, 
this is what we had to do because it gets so narrow back there with the, I mean, it's been a while. Go ahead and come down a little bit, Doug. It's hard to see it from this angle. Yeah, it looks it. like it's gonna catch on the apron. No, it'll barely clear right there. Okay. Okay. Ready? Yep. Very slowly. Good. There we go. Clear, let's bring it back. Right there. Yep. All right, Doug, keep coming. We're gonna make it, huh? Yep. All right, Doug. Okay. Come on down. Okay. Ow. Oh, you all right? It hurts. That's because I have no hair to tell me I'm getting close. <laughs> Ready? I have no hair. Yeah. Oh, my hairbrush. Hold it. Okay. Got this one started. Ow, that's twice. Well, oh no. Do you have one started over there, Justin? Uh, yes, yes. Well, the back one is. Same here. So we can lower down a little more? Yeah. Okay. I got sensitive ears. Sorry, Royal. <laughs> I got sensitive ears. Yes. Ready? Go ahead. Hooked, strap it up. Hooked. I think you can go up. Ready? Yeah. You got a pogo? Pogo? Yeah, I'll go grab a pogo. Okay. How about if we just put our suspension together up here? You got uh, two other uh, bol uh, bolts for the steering gear? Yeah, I needed an ALL -L for that. An ALL? <laughs> All? <laughs> That's what I'm trying to oh! say. That's what I'm trying to say. An ALL. -L. I know how to spell all. Well, the rear end went in quite well, but the front end kind of uh, kicked our butts. Yeah. The, run the, the rear end went in really swell. No problem with that cross member when we finally got it. Glad it's done. Yeah. Gee, me Christmas, what a battle that was. <laughs> so now that we got the cross member uh, in and connected, we went ahead and got the uh, upper control arms. Yeah, so now that the front and rear suspensions are in. Um, oh, we got those nice, shiny Krager wheels on this baby. <laughs> yeah. Love it. Right on, man. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, you guys. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to call her a day. Yeah. Me too. Can you give him the superhero pose? Superhero pose. <laughs>